Okay, fiscal focus time brought to you by InfoChoice, the choice of information on Australian consumer finance. Now, this week, we're going to discuss something that a lot of people don't quite like to talk about, and that's divorce. Joining us to discuss is Diane Loveday, the founder of Bayside Mediation, Australia's largest private family dispute resolution mediation practice. Hi, Diane. Thanks for joining us on the Savings Tip Jar. Uh, hi, Dom. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Diane, for joining us. So uh, straight off the bat, we'll just ask a kind of broad overarching question. Um, what are the general costs of divorce um, and what... What, what might people not consider when they're entering um, that divorce process? Okay, so I think first we really need to clarify that divorce and separation are two different things. So cost of divorce is about $900. And really, if you're computer savvy, you can go onto the family law, uh, the family uh, court website and, and organise it yourselves, and it's, it's a pretty easy process. But cost comes with the negotiations around your parenting arrangements and your financial separation. So they're, they're two very different things. And it's interestingly, you can be divorced and not have sorted out your parenting and finances. Um, it can add to the costs down the track if you haven't sorted your finances out relatively quickly after a divorce. So my advice is always get to it quickly. But in terms of the cost of separating, and I'll use the term separating if that's okay with you guys, because I think it's a clear distinction. Um, the cost of separating really does depend on who you choose to help you through that process. Um, cost of litigation with lawyers, if you end up with a final hearing, it is not unusual to spend $100,000. Um, actually, one of my right. colleagues, he spent $100,000 and his former wife spent $150,000. And that money comes out of the acquired pool. So that's generally the, um, you know, the, the equity in your property. So it's a very expensive process if you head down the litigation path. So Diane, just on that note, can you talk through some of the differences between, say, a lawyer and an independent mediator when it comes yeah. to divorce? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so lawyers have obligations under law that are different to what a family law mediator has. Um, as a, my, my official title is Family Dispute Resolution Practitioner, and we are a legal alternative to using lawyers when couples separate. So we have a specialist qualification, we do a graduate diploma, we do some training in family law, but we're not lawyers, generally speaking. Even if you have a law degree, you're not allowed to give legal advice as a family dispute resolution practitioner. But what we have are the skills, knowledge and expertise to help people negotiate and um, um, come up with their own agreements. Um, and those agreements comply with the Family Law Act that we then can document in, in generally in a consent order form and submit to the court and they then have an agreement that is legally binding but has cost, uh, uh, look, I estimate about 5% of the cost of using a lawyer to reach exactly the same agreement and in a fraction of the time. There we go. It seems like if you're not careful, the only real winners out of a divorce are lawyers uh, who collect a fee off that service. So um, we'll talk more about you know, you made the important distinction. There's divorce and there's separation. Um, what are the general costs um, or how can you mitigate the costs of separation? You know, it seems like the most daunting aspect of it is unraveling the kind of uh, structure in a, in a family unit that you've set up over the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years even. Um, so how uh, can you mitigate that? And uh, what are the sort of main concerns around that that you see cl uh, clients coming to you with? Okay, so um, unraveling your your financial history is, is one of the big issues of separating, obviously. And the longer you're together, the harder it can be for some people. The, the number one mistake people make is assuming they need to lawyer up first and foremost. There's recent research that shows us that um, couples who use mediation first or attempt mediation first have better outcomes than couples who go directly to litigation and lawyers. And it's really simple and understandable because the first thing your lawyer is going to do is send a letter to your ex demanding discovery, you know, demanding all sorts of things, and your ex is going to get their back up and life is going to be you know, painful for up to three years. Um, whereas with FDR mediation, we 
we um, take the place of two lawyers. So we don't represent either party. We are there to bring people together. After we've met with them independently, then we bring them together to have a managed, safe conversation. And we find our research, more than 80% of our clients, reach an agreement with our support on their own. They don't need the litigation. So... The biggest mistake people do is is head straight to lawyers and often they're not getting the information they need because before unravelling your family, you've got to unravel the legal system. You've got to understand the process and knowledge is savings. Knowledge is power. So if you can understand the legal process and what is your, what are your obligations, what are your requirements under the Act, if you can understand that, then you're going to save yourself a lot of pain financially and emotionally. Um, and that's what we do. We provide people lots and lots and lots of information around the family law process and we explain things in a way that makes sense. So we're not lawyers, so we don't use jargon and we're not charging by six minute increments. And so we are, you know, and if you use a family law specialist, for example, um, their fee structure is somewhere between $700 and $900 an hour. Love it if I could do that, but I can't. Uh, so our, our, our cost, as I said, is about 5% of using a lawyer. Even if a lawyer was, if, you know, if we take people all the way through with property and children's matters, it's generally less than $5,000 for both of them. So it's much, much less expensive. Um, other mistakes people make is to not do research. They listen to their friends and family. And, you know, we all know somebody who's been, has got a horror story about a divorce or a separation um, and they listen to those people, but everybody's circumstances are uniquely their own. No two families are exactly the same. I mean, you can't compare, for example, let's say a, a young couple who are separating, um, maybe have a house, been together for five years with a family that is 20 years established, small business, um, you know, totally different circumstances. So sitting with somebody, explaining your particular situation and getting some uh, some information, I've got to be careful not to use the word advice, I'm not allowed to give legal advice, uh, so give the information uh, that is directly relevant to your situation is the key. So, Diane, I saw reports recently that um, there's been a bit of a rise in the rate of uh, grey divorces. So that's divorces of people who are uh, a bit further along in their life, maybe in their 50s or 60s. So I was wondering, you know, with what you said earlier about how, you know, the, the longer the marriage, um, the, the, you know, the, the harder it can be to unravel the sort of joint finances. So I wonder if um, for those that are either in retirement or approaching retirement, whether there's there's different things to consider with your finances with regards to going through a divorce. Okay, I think the key thing to consider is there's no replacing the money it costs you to get the divorce or the separation. So obviously for people are, who are still employed, um, there's an opportunity to recoup the cost of the separation or the 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 um the split of the of the pool but with people who are uh, already um, uh, um, retired or who are approaching retirement their, their resources are finite so it's really important for them to really consider where is the best place to go to have those conversations and look let, let me say there are obviously situations where lawyers are necessary you know there are very um very difficult matters, complicated matters that are way beyond me. I'm completely first person to put my hand up and say, sorry, you know, beyond my pay grade. But then there are people also who are in um, family violence situations. They often need a bit more protection and support and help. So lawyers are useful, but finding, <laughs> it's very condescending, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but find, but um, with older, older couples, being very mindful of um, how they want to, to separate and where they want to live after separation. So often you find people have lived in the, a, a street for a lot, lot of years, so they love the suburb and they won't, both want to buy back into that suburb. Not possible if you're spending $100,000, $200,000 each on, um, on litigation. So finding a solution that is just and equitable, which is one of the requirements of the Act, um, but doesn't spend a, a huge proportion of your pool um, is, is a really big consideration. For sure. And 
you know, you, you talked about some things being above your pay scale and you might not be able to answer this from like a, a clinical perspective, but what is it that gets people so rolled up in a divorce? Their first instinct is to go to a lawyer to get defensive. Is there ego bruise? What's what's the go there? Often it is bruised ego um, because there's one party who has made the decision to end the relationship and the other party is not happy about it. Um, we talk about um, a sort of a continuum where when people separate, one party is, is done and dusted. They're, so they've been through the emotional hurdles. They've been up and down with their emotions. They've got to the point where they've had the courage to say, you know what, it's over. I don't want to do this anymore. And then they're, they're, they're calm. They're, they're set. They're, they're they have their clear vision. They know where they want to go. They're, they're fine. But then for that other party, that's when their emotional turmoil starts. And so that's when you can end up with really nasty uh, litigation because it can be easily fueled by somebody who doesn't have the right intentions. So we're very mindful of helping people get to the same point in the process uh, so as they can have a managed conversation and negotiate their agreements. You know, it's, it's interesting. We're talking about older couples separating. There's the, it's quite distinction, uh, quite a distinction. So uh, older women, it's often because they, in our experience, often because they've just been treading water, waiting for the kids to get old enough, and then they leave. For guys, it's often because they found somebody else. Uh, so it's a very, very different dynamic. So you can imagine then I'm dealing with um, a very hurt, upset partner partner because uh, you know 30 40 year relationship and we're dealing with a couple at the moment where they're in their 70s um, um, and they're, they're devastated so it takes a bit of also therapy if you like while we're not therapists and we're not counseling um, sometimes you need to have a bit of a, a, a gentle perspective it definitely sounds like it's you know pretty emotional toll on um, a lot of people going through this process. Um, just wanting, Diane, are there some surprising things that people might not know about the divorce process and, and the costs around it? Some things that people don't know too much about heading into the, the whole process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I often, um, when I'm talking to people, we will get people call us who've received that first letter from, from the other party's lawyer. And I explained to them there is no legal obligation to respond to that letter. So you don't have to respond to a lawyer's letter. And most people are very surprised to hear that. I mean, if it's a letter from the court, yep, absolutely, you've got to respond to anything from the court. But a letter from your other, the ex's lawyer, no, you don't necessarily have to respond to it. And this is, again, where people get themselves in... Um, into a real bind because they assume they have to. Um, another interesting fact is that there's only four guiding principles in property settlements in this country. So, you know, it's pretty, it's not brain surgery. I say to people, you know, if it was brain surgery, I couldn't do it. But, you know, what are the assets and liabilities? What are the future needs? What are the contributions? And is it a just and equitable disbursement of the available pool? That is what we all have to use in order to produce an agreement that the court will find acceptable. Um, so it doesn't need to be um, a nasty experience. Oh, look, I've had people hug after they've made their agreement, have reached their agreement. Um, it, not often, but, <laughs> but it does happen. Um, but more often than not, people uh, leave our space relieved that they've resolved it quickly and um, and without having to spend a small fortune. Um, you know, the, the, the whole um, legal process, what people don't understand, uh, another one that people don't understand is that um, you don't get to meet your judge until you're in the, in the thick of it for a year or two. Um, your first appearances aren't you standing in front of a judge, you know, explaining your position. No, your first experience is just to find out who your judge will be and find out who your registrar is going to be and find out what you have to then do in relation to further your matter down the process. And to get to that point can often take six months, eight months. So you know, people expect that um, it'll be a relatively quick process and very often it's not. For sure. Um, and it's probably not the healthiest way to think going into a marriage, but um, is it worthwhile sort of protecting yourself? You, you know, you hear so much, especially on, you know, um, television from America about prenups and, uh, you know, keeping finances separate. But 
is all that all for naught when all the family finances are sort of tied together anyway and um, and you have kids and, and other assets and whatnot? The short answer is yes, but the long answer is um, most people understand the longer you're together, the, the more your everything you acquire, debt or asset, is, is considered joint. So the longer you're together, the less... The, the less validity a document like a, um, a prenup might have. If if you're going into a, a relationship and you have high net worth, it's probably worthwhile having a chat to a lawyer and just seeing uh, what you can do to protect yourself. Um, I actually gave that advice to a girlfriend of mine recently. Yeah. No, and, and I know that, you know, the longer they're together, the less validity that document will have. But to protect yourself in the short term, I thought, you know, it, what can it hurt? Um, you know, obviously having children changes everything. The moment you have children um, and, and there's also uh, the concept that uh, you can't sign away your rights. So even if you um, create one of these documents, uh, you, you don't necess- it's not necessarily going to create for you the, the, the solution that you're hoping for. I had a really interesting situation where a young woman came to me with a, a format for a prenup. Her fiancé, they're days away from this marriage, the fiancé had gone to his lawyer and crea- had got this document created. Now, for them to be valid, you've got to have two lawyers check them and both lawyers have to sign off. She couldn't find a lawyer who would sign it off. So... When a lawyer who knew me sent it to me to see if I could help them negotiate an agreement that would be more useful to them. Um, ultimately, I spoke to her, then I spoke to him, um, and he just was not um, going to be... I, I'd be very surprised if that marriage actually went ahead because he did not like the, the, the information that he was given because um, it, it, it just was incredibly uh, one-sided and at the moment they had children all of it would have changed and um, and that's why they were marrying they both wanted children so you know you can't hoard property because you're getting married it just is going to happen <laughs> sorry <laughs> And I guess just like anything that involves, you know, people and relationships that there are challenges, but I guess, you know, for our listeners, it probably is a relief to know that there are things they can do to, to help manage um, the process a bit better and uh, utilize services such as yours. It's good to know that um, that's out there to help people. Uh, Diane Loveday, uh, thanks so much for your time on the savings tip show. I really appreciate your insights. Thank you for having me. I've really appreciated it. And I hope I've been, I've been a help. Absolutely. Um, Good to know for us in the future if and when the time comes, which is (laughs) hopefully never. Uh, But yeah, thanks again, Diane. (laughs) Bye.